Okay, let's model now with A and B, these two loci, now physically on the same chromosome. What this would mean for this diploid organism, now starting with this same dihybrid that we had before, but now modeling it as if the loci were physically located on the same chromosome, that would mean that these alleles we would have to be careful to draw the correct alleles on the correct chromosome. So if we're saying if that's an input into this dihybrid, and now that we're making the assumption that they're linked, in order to show how we can model a meiosis with these loci linked together, we have to be certain that we get the little a and the little b on one of the chromosome homologs. And that's because little a and little and big b, sorry, come together as a packet. Likewise, the big A and the little b come together as a packet as well. So here's the 2N cell that's now going to undergo meiosis. So if we say this is a myocyte, the first step is replication of chromosomes, and then synapsis. And I've already drawn them together for the synapsis step. When we have two loci on the same chromosome, there's a number of different things that can happen. One thing that we didn't discuss in the previous diagrams was this possibility of crossing over. Crossing over is breakage and rejoining. So if I draw two chromosomes that are synapsed here. During synapsis, chromosomes that are synapsed with one another have the possibility of actually breaking and rejoining. This happens at adjacent nucleotides, such that no nucleotides are lost from either strand. So it's a precise breakage of a rejoining, and it's a double-stranded break. So we've actually now, this copy of the chromosome, this double-stranded DNA molecule, is now physically attached down here, and this one is now physically attached here. We have to draw them as, as an X in order to show what's going on, but in reality this is happening with very flexible molecules that are very close to one another. So we've got this just precise breakage and, re, re, and rejoining at adjacent nucleotides. So crossing over can happen anywhere along this length. Now the issue is, is that the probability of a crossover happening is proportional to the number of nucleotides or the physical distance between two loci. The closer two loci are together, the less likely it is that a crossover will happen in between them. And the farther apart two loci are, the more likely it is that there will be a physical crossover between them. And you might remember again that we discussed how recombination is a genetic event and independent assortment previously is one possible physical event that can lead to recombination. So too with crossing over. Crossing over is a physical event that may lead to recombination. In order to have recombination for loci that are linked, it requires that there be a crossover between them. So what we'll do is we'll model this meiosis starting without a crossover, and then we'll model it with a crossover to show the differences. And then we'll discuss how that impacts recombination frequency, because now recombination frequency is going to be dependent on the physical distance between two loci. Okay, so in the absence of a crossover, things are fairly straightforward. It's actually easier to model meiosis with one chromosome, because there's less to, to draw. So there's the meiosis 1 division to give us those two cells, and then meiosis 2, just as we did before. So in the absence of a crossover between the two loci, we end up with nothing but non-recombinant products of meiosis. Fairly straightforward. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and model this with a crossover.
So if we model this with a crossover between the two loci, what we're seeing is there is physical breakage and rejoining of these double-stranded DNA molecules at the synapsis step. Now this changes things when we go to the M1 division. Now we actually have to trace out individual chromosomes that are attached to this centromere. So the meiosis 1 division separates these two synapsed pairs from one another into the two resulting daughter cells. In this case, this top uh, chromatid is what this is called, chromosome that's attached to another copy of itself at a centromere, it's called a chromatid. This top chromatid has the big A allele and the little b allele. But it doesn't have the same set of alleles on the other chromatid. We also have the big A allele here, but then there's a breakage and rejoining to connect to the large B allele here. So we would actually have to draw it like this. So that's the one product of the meiosis 1 div division. Now the other product is as follows. And again, we need to trace chromatids. So the centromere is what gets moved. So we'll trace from the centromere and we come to a little a and a little b. Oh, sorry, a little a and a big b on the bottom. And then on the top, chromatid here, we come to the big a, sorry, little a, and then breakage and rejoining to give us the little b. So that's the other product of the meiosis 1 division. If we take this on to meiosis 2, what we then would see is just the readout of what we get in the meiosis 1 division. Okay. In terms of what is recombinant and what is non-recombinant, now we have recombinant and non-recombinant gametes in the same products, the same four products of a single myocyte going through meiosis. So this one we've seen before, that's non-recombinant. Here's a new combination that's not present in either input. Here's the other new combination, and here's another non-recombinant one. So this is the results of a single meiosis with a crossover between the two loci. So in the next segment, what we'll start to look at is the effect of the distance between the two loci and how that affects the probability of a crossover, and as a result, the frequency of recombination that we will see.